Good evening and welcome to Spooky Stitches, the podcast that is 50% wool and 50% ectoplasm. My name is Sheena Perrell and I'm a writer and knitwear designer and I'm coming to you from the Pacific Northwest. I hope that October is treating all of you better than it has been treating me, which is not very kindly. <laughs> um, we've had a lot of stuff going on. I did a health update recently that covers some of it. Uh, the other thing is that I'm losing my job in a week, so get prepared for another glut of videos. I actually spent most of yesterday doing batch filming, so you should have several new, uh, not podcast episodes, but just other videos coming up in the next few weeks. And also, I just want to let you know, I do live on a flight path, so there will be airplane noises in the background. I think they recently changed some of their routes, so the planes have been more frequent and they've been a lot louder the last few days. So just keep that in mind if there are a lot of jump cuts or background noise in this episode. If you enjoy true crime podcasts, then I highly encourage you to check out the link down below. I now have an audio-only podcast that is up on Spotify and Google called The Ghosts of Highway 16, which deals with the missing and murdered Indigenous women along the Highway of Tears in Northern British Columbia, Canada. Uh, we're looking at all of the 80 some odd cases I've been able to track down and looking at them chronologically. So if that sounds like it's something up your alley, check out the link down below. Um, also this month, uh, you will no longer see a Patreon link down below because I have decided to cancel my Patreon. It was never really that successful um, and really it was requiring me to do more work than I was actually getting paid for to keep it running. So no more Patreon. If you want to support my work, please do check out my books as well as my Ko-Fi coffee um, link down below. Those are the best way to support my work and keep my production going. So I think that that is more than enough on updates. So let's just go ahead and get into the finished objects. So I think I showed some of these the last time that I spoke, but I made a bunch of face scrubbies. This is just like lily sugar and cream, cotton yarn, and I'm really sorry about the color balance on this video. I don't know what is causing it to change so dramatically and frequently. Um, I'm just recording on an old cell phone. I have very little control over what it decides to do. But uh, anyway, these are some face scrubbies. I think I used a J or a K hook for most of them. So we've got a little cat, a skull. This is the one that kind of started it all. A little ghost. and a witch's hat. Um, so I made four sets of these. I gave one to Ash, I'm keeping one for myself, and then I have two others that I'm going to gift or do something else with. But those are really fun to make. I also put up a free pattern for all four of those. It's a bundle you can find it in my Ravelry store, which is linked down below. In addition to that, I also made myself a loofah, technically like a loofah and a half. Um, I'm not going to show you the first one I made because it's already been used in the shower and gone through the wash and everything. So this is the second one I made and this is just some leftover yarn. Um, and I want to add a little bit more to it because it's a little bit more on the fluffy bare side, which I mean, that's fine, but I want a little bit more poofy. And this is, um, I didn't use a pattern for this. It's more like a recipe. And basically you just, uh, you make a magic ring, single crochet in until it gets really tight, tighten up the magic ring. And then you crochet two stitches for every one stitch and you just keep going and it makes this sort of brain corally look. 
Um, I was using a smaller yarn than normal. Normally this is done with lily sugar and cream. This time I used worsted weight yarn. So I ended up doing clusters of three for every one stitch on the row below. So I wanna add a little bit more to it, but this is very soft and squishy and I like using these in the shower. I've needed more for a while. The other thing that I finished was a cat sweater. <laughs> And I can't stop giggling every time I think about this. I'm going to insert pictures here because I'm not sure where Bast is at the moment. He has been over grooming lately and I decided to make him a little sweater. He has, he's worn um, like onesies and t-shirts before in the past just because they help him with anxiety. He just really likes wearing them. He likes being a cozy little boy. Um, so I went ahead and made him a sweater and it's super cute. And now I need to make sweaters for Gwyd and Hermes. <laughs> Gwyd also wears shirts for anxiety. And also when we first adopted him, he was extremely skinny and underweight and he would get very cold as a result. So he started off wearing t-shirts just to give him a little bit of an extra layer of warmth. And then, uh, when I was prototyping Bast's sweater, I accidentally made one of the prototypes too big and it fit Hermes. We tested it on him just to see and he really liked it. Like he just totally chilled out once it was on him. He didn't want me to take it off. So now I have one on the needles for him, which is right here. This is the back and we've got the front. One thing that I learned is you need to make the armholes much bigger than you think you do, just so that they have that free range of motion. And the one that I did for Bast is out of uh, Knit Picks Comfy Color Mist. I don't remember the colorway. I can't find the label for it. But they have three different shades of blue that are very similar, and it's one of those shades of blue. <laughs> Um, and then this one for Hermes is Cloudborn Fibers Pima Cotton Decay in the color Sea Green, right there. And what size needle? This is a size 5 or 3.75 millimeter, and I use the same needles for both cat sweaters. So this, okay, yep, decay, I just said that. So, um, they're DK worsted weight sweaters, so using the same needles for them. It's coming out super cute, and Hermes is a tuxedo cat, so he looks really good in this color with his black fur and his green eyes. And now I feel like I need to make him one that looks like a little dinner jacket since he's a tuxedo and put a bow tie on it because wouldn't that just be so freaking cute? I think that would be adorable. The last finished object that I have is actually right behind me and is in use on my bed. And I can't really show you the whole thing because it's kind of massive for this framing. I finished it! This is the afghan that I started making two years ago before we moved into this apartment and finally finished in the last month or so. Um, this is, it's an improvised pattern, but it, the chevron thing is a, like, it's a known crochet stitch pattern, if that makes sense. Um, it's meant to fit a full-size bed, which is what I have. And this seafoam color is Knit Picks Brava in the color Tranquil. The black is also Knit Picks Brava. And then this is the Joanne, um, I'm blanking on the name now. It's their version of like Red Heart. It's their story yarn and it's just teal is the colored name. But I love it. I've been using it a lot. It lives on my bed now and all of the cats look gorgeous on it because it really sets off all of their coloring. Okay, so let's move on to the whips, which I've been working on a lot of things. <laughs> I don't know that I'm making a ton of progress, but I mean, I had a lot of, 
finished objects. I had more than I did last month at least, so that's something. So first of all, we have the flamingo sweater, and I don't remember where this was the last time I showed it to you, but there is a completed body, one completed sleeve, and I have started on the second sleeve. So this one, it's not a super active project right now. I'm trying to get the next two things done that I'm going to show you. And, and the cat sweaters, because the cat sweaters make me happy. Um, <laughs> I giggle uncontrollably I, as soon as I put those on the cats. Like, it, it's ridiculous, and I've scared them a little bit with my maniacal laughter. Um, but I just find cats and sweaters to be incredibly adorable and hysterical. <laughs> so here is the second sleeve. Um, it's going very slowly. It's a sleeve. They usually go kind of slow. And that is Nitpick's Stroll in color Way Red Wing Blackbird. And the like pinky coral color is Trey Liz when you play the game of Indie. Both of those are fingering weight yarns. And they're on a size four needle. I'm using my interchangeables for those. Um, improvised pattern as usual and I don't know what else I can say about that I mean I will go over more of the construction details once it's a finished object but for now I'm just on sleeve island and working my way through it okay next up we have the Eleonora stocking this is my reproduction of a 16th century silk hand net stocking that was found in the burial of Eleonora de Toledo in Florence so this is where we're at, and I believe that this is where I was the last time I showed it to you. So I'm working on the final ankle increases right now, and then, um, this is so blown out, this yarn is so red that it blows out every time it's on camera. Um, so you can see I'm working on the increases right here just to get it back to what the starting width was up here and then from there I'm adding in the gusset which is going to be kind of y-shaped and coming out from here so I really want to finish this by the end of November I'm going to work on it some more later today um, and we're getting into the exciting part where I have no idea what happens next and this is two skeins of knit picks Luminance Lace Held Double. It is in the color Passion. The needles are size triple zero. I don't advise using them. And other than that, I, I don't have much to say about them right now other than they have their own website, which you will also find linked down below. My next whip I'm not going to pull out and physically show you right here because it's a color work project and it has a lot of ends and balls of yarn hanging off of it at the moment. Um, but it is my copy of one of Wednesday's sweaters from the Wednesday TV show. I am about two thirds of the way done with the back panel and it's going along pretty well. It's just kind of difficult for me to work on. I'm not used to doing Tunisian crochet, which this is my first ever Tunisian crochet pattern. Um, and I want to get both of those done by the end of November. So the Wednesday sweater and the Eleonora sock. I'm trying to get those done. Those are my two priority knits that I want to get off the needles as soon as possible. Um, the Wednesday sweater is Caron Simply Soft in black and off-white. And I don't remember what size hook I'm using on that. It's a J hook. It's a J a size J Tunisian crochet hook. The next thing is actually a finished object. I have it in the wrong part of my list. Uh, I made a seat cushion for the seat that I am sitting in right now. 
Um, I got this chair from the thrift store. It's actually a dining room chair, but it's on wheels. And I bought one of a set of six and they all had these kind of ugly orange cushions on them. Orange is not my color. I do not like orange. Um, so I went ahead and knit a cover for it using the leftover yarn from this afghan. And I was totally out of the dark teal. I have a ball maybe that big left. So I just used the tranquil and the black to knit it up. It's just color blocked. It's very simple. It's going to have my ass on it all the time, so I don't really care what it looks like. I just wanted something that was going to be a little bit prettier and fit a little bit more with the decor than the orange. I tolerated the orange because it was very similar to the wood tone color, but it needed to change, and I'm very happy with it. It adds a little extra squish to the cushion, um, and I'll, I'll put some pictures in here of the finish. Another one that I just have pictures of because they have already gone off to the recipient is what I'm calling the Hobbit socks. I started these um, back in June, knit the first sock right away, second sock languished, and then I knit it in like two sittings. Um, but I got this, it's unique yarns, and I got it at my new LYS. Well, it's new to me, the LYS has been there for a while, but I just went there for the first time in June and found unique cotton. It is hand dyed self striping cotton yarn. It was $15.50 and the color is 1080. It doesn't have a name um, but it made me think of hobbits and anytime that I find like a fingering or DK weight uh, sock yarn in cotton. Um, I always make a pair of socks for Ash because she's allergic to lanolin and is extremely sensitive to animal fibers. So um, if I find a sock weight yarn, I make her socks anytime I find it. Uh, one thing I will say, I made these uh, like your standard mid-calf socks, it took the entire ball of yarn. I had the equivalent of maybe three stripes left on the ball when I was done. It was pretty close. The last thing that I am working on this week, so this is going to be the first time you see it and also the last time you see it for a while just because it's another afghan. So my afghans live in the living room. I work on them when I'm watching TV and because they are so big and bulky and hard to show on camera, I don't usually show progress updates for them. But I've literally been looking for how to do this stitch for 15 years. Um, so Ash has a blanket in this stitch pattern. It's called cat stitch that she got from her grandmother when she was very young. However, her grandmother made it in pink and white. <laughs> and those are not Ash's colors. She is a hobbit. So um, we also had a cat a few years ago. He has since passed on named Loki. The chaos came before the name and he was the yarn eating cat. He would steal socks out of the laundry, like pull it through the slats in the laundry basket so that he could chew on them. He adored hand knit yarn, or he adored hand knit items. He stole a amigurumi flamingo that I made off of my nightstand, and he would growl when we tried to take it away from him, so we just let him have it. Um, he didn't really eat the yarn, but he definitely chewed it to pieces. And so for a while he was walking around with the decapitated head of a flamingo and would growl if we tried to take it away. But finally we had to because it was fraying and it needed to go in the garbage. But um, he chewed holes in the original blanket. He chewed really bad holes in there. And it's an acrylic blanket. It's from the early 80s. Well, I guess not early 80s, probably more like early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. So it's not in the best shape. It has been washed and used and worn many, many times. And 
she's always wanted a replacement so I'm working on that for her now and these are more her colors she really likes purple in addition to the earth tones and black and I found a bag of the Joanne yarn at the thrift store and it was four skeins of the dark purple and four skeins of the light purple and I'm just like that's it that's an afghan um so this right here is a skein and a half of each color well maybe not quite half but um I've already started on my second skein of each color it's a really simple stitch pattern and um I'm not as good at reading crochet as I am at reading knitting, so that's why I can reverse engineer it the way I normally would. But I will link to the tutorial that I used down below. Um, I don't know why it took so long for me to find what this pattern was, because I would search on and off for years, like, cat stitch. What is cat stitch? And I'd get no results. And that's literally the name of the stitch, <laughs> because they're kitties. So I have to start on that blanket. It's going to be more of a throw blanket, so I'm just going to go until I run out of yarn. It is roughly the width of a twin bed. I made it a little bit narrower than that one. Um, but she just wanted something to be cozy and cuddled up with. It doesn't need to cover a whole bed. So that's the last project that I am working on. Okay, our last segment today is going to be watch, read, play. So for watch, I do have a recommendation for you down below. I'm going to link to another YouTuber. Um, so I have stopped doing knit tea just because it was taking so long. I don't have time for the research for it as much as I think it's a great idea and I would love to do it. She covers all of the gossip from the knitting world. <laughs> knitting and crochet. So if you are interested in that, I will link to her program down below. Other than that, I have been watching a Korean drama on Netflix called It's Okay to Not Be Okay. Um, I really like it. It has kind of like hints of the paranormal in it, but it also deals a whole lot with mental health and childhood trauma and just working your way through all of that. Um, it does have a romance story in it, but it's more of a lighter romance, I think. Um, I'm not a big romance reader or watcher, but I do really like the story and I like the relationship between the two main characters. I've also finished up three books in the last month or so. Well, probably more than a month, more like two months. Um, I'm still fighting off a reading slump that's been going on for a couple of years now, unfortunately. Um, but I looked up to see if one of my favorite authors had anything new out and I found a whole bunch of stuff. So if you like spooky mysteries, especially historicals, I recommend you look for Simone St. James. She has a whole series of books set in the 1920s and they're not a series as in like book one, book two, book three, but they're a group of books that take place in the same world. So you can read them in any order. Um, but you might see like familiar characters passing between them. And she released a book called The Sunset Motel and a short story called Ghost 19. And I read, or I listened to the audio of both of those. Sunset Motel was really good. Um, I saw one of the twists coming, but not the other. So it was really, really good. Um, it's another like amateur sleuth featuring, I think she's 19, um, this young woman traveling to a remote town to try and find what happened to her aunt who disappeared before she was born. But it's a really great story. It was very edge of your seat. I loved it from start to finish and it's a dual timeline. So you see things from the perspective of the aunt when she was 19, as well as the perspective of the niece. Um, Ghost 19 is the story of a failed actress who also ends up in a small town for her rest and recovery and take in the fresh air and stay away from stimulants and the drama of the stage. And she becomes obsessed with watching her neighbors through her back living room window. And there's actually like two different 
mysteries that end up showing up that she's solving by watching the neighbors but you don't realize until the end that they're connected and they're it's really good I'm describing it poorly <laughs> um so Ghost 19 and the Sunset Motel are both really good and you should look them up uh, currently I am reading Shadow and Bone I was given the box set of this series for my birthday and I've only recently decided to sit down and start reading it again or reading it for the first time rather um so I'm only like a quarter of the way into the first book but I am really enjoying it it's just that I'm having trouble sitting down to read it um I'm at a point right now because of my fatigue where I'm looking for easier stimuli and more audio stimuli than visual. So that's why I've listened to more audiobooks, um, been watching more like YouTube and TV programs. Um, but I do really enjoy the book and I, I'm trying to get myself to just sit down and mainline it the way that I used to read a book. Um, it's just been really hard for me to get myself to that point. And speaking of books, I think it's time for us to move on to our spooky story for the evening. So tonight's story comes once again from the Virago Book of Ghost Stories. I was refer referencing this so much on archive.org that I went ahead and ordered a paperback copy, but you can still read it for free online and I will have a link to that down below. Uh, we're reading the second story in the book tonight, which is called The Violet Car by E. Wharton. Um, I have not abridged this one. Sometimes I have to do that just for time because of the podcast length and my computer's ability to upload video. Um, but we do have the full story intact this time, and we'll see if you can figure out the twist at the end. I'm unaccustomed to literary effort, and I feel I shall not say what I have to say or that it will convince you unless I say it very plainly. I thought I could adorn my story with pleasant words prettily arranged, but as I pause to think of what really happened, I see the plainest words will be the best. I do not know how to weave a plot or how to embroider it. It is best not to try. Those things happened. I have no skill to add to what happened, nor is any adding of mine needed. I am a nurse, and I was sent for to go to Charlestown, a mental case. It was November, and the fog was thick in London, so that my cab went at a foot's pace, so I missed the train by which I should have gone. I sent a telegram to Charlestown and waited in the dismal waiting room at London Bridge. The time was passed for me by a little child. Its mother, a widow, seemed too crushed to be able to respond to its quick questionings. She answered briefly and not, as it seemed, to the child's satisfaction. The child itself presently seemed to perceive that its mother was not, so to speak, available. It leaned back on the wide, dusty seat and yawned. I caught its eye and smiled. It would not smile, but it looked. I took out of my bag a silk purse, bright with beads and steel tassels, and turned it over and over. Presently, the child slid along the seat and said, Let me. After that, all was easy. The mother sat with eyes closed. When I rose to go, she opened them and thanked me. The child, clinging, kissed me. Later, I saw them get into the first-class carriage in my train. My ticket was a third-class one. I expected, of course, that there would be a conveyance of some sort to meet me at the station, but there was nothing. Nor was there a cab or a fly to be seen. It was by this time nearly dark, and the wind was driving the rain almost horizontally along the unfrequented road that lay beyond the door of the station. I looked out forlorn and perpl I looked out forlorn and perplexed. Haven't you engaged a carriage? It was the widow lady who spoke. I explained. My motor will be here directly, she said. You'll let me drive you. Where is it you're going? Charlestown, I said, and as I said it, I was aware of a very odd change in her face. A faint change, but quite unmistakable. Why do you look like that? I asked her bluntly, and of course she said, like what? There's nothing wrong with the house? I said, for that, I found, was what I had taken the faint change to signify, and I was very young, and one has heard tales. No reason why I shouldn't go there, I mean? Oh, no, no. 
She glanced out through the rain, and I knew as well as though she had told me that there was a reason why she should not wish to go there. Don't trouble, I said. It's very kind of you, but it's probably out of your way, and... Oh, but I'll take you. Of course I'll take you, she said. And the child said, Mother, here comes the car. And it did come, though neither of us heard it till the child had spoken. I know nothing of motor cars, and I don't know the names of any of the parts of them. This one was like a brom, only you got it in the back, as you do in a wagonette. The seats were in the corners, and when the door was shut, there was a little seat that pulled up, and the child sat in on it between us. And it moved like magic, or like a dream of a train. We drove quickly through the dark. I could hear the wind screaming and the wild dashing of the rain against the windows, even through the whirring of the machinery. One could see nothing of the country, only the black night and the shafts of light from the lamps in front. After, as it seemed, a very long time, the chauffeur got down and opened a gate. We went through it, and after that the road was very much rougher. We were quite silent in the car, and the child had fallen asleep. We stopped, and the car stood pulsating as though it were out of breath while the chauffeur hauled down my box. It was so dark that I could not see the shape of the house, only the lights in the downstairs windows, and the low-walled front garden faintly revealed by their light and the light of the motor lamps. Yet I felt that it was a fair-sized house, that it was surrounded by big trees, and that there was a pond or river close by. In daylight the next day, I found that all of this was so. I have never been able to tell how I knew it at first night, in the dark, but I did know it. Perhaps there was something in the way the rain fell on the trees on on the water. I don't know. The chauffeur took my box up a stone path, wherein I got out and said my goodbyes and thanks. Don't wait. Please don't, I said. I'm all right now. Thank you a thousand times. The car, however, stood pulsating until I had reached the doorstep, and then it caught its breath, as it were, throbbed more loudly, turned, and went. And still the door had not opened. I felt for the knocker and rapped smartly. Inside the door, I was sure I heard whispering. The car light was fast diminishing into a little distant star, and its panting sounded now hardly at all. When it ceased to sound at all, the place was quiet as death. The lights glowed redly from curtained windows, but there was no other sign of life. I wished I had not been in such a hurry to part from my escort, from human companionship, and from the great, solid, competent pres presence of the motor car. I knocked again, and this time I followed the knock by a shout. Hello, I cried. Let me in. I am the nurse. There was a pause, such a pause as would allow time for the whisperers to exchange glances on the other side of a door. Then a bolt ground back, a key turned, and the doorway framed no longer cold, wet wood, but light and welcoming warmth and faces. Come in, oh, come in, said a voice, a woman's voice, and the voice of a man said, We didn't know there was anyone there, and I had shaken the very door with my knockings. I went in, blinking at the light, and the man called a servant, and between them they carried my box upstairs. The woman took my arm and led me into a low, square room, pleasant, homely, and comfortable, with a solid mid-Victorian comfort, the kind that expressed itself in rep and mahogany. In the lamplight, I turned to look at her. She was small and thin, her hair, her face, and her hands were of the same tint of grayish-yellow. "'Mrs. Eldridge?' I asked. "'Yes,' she said very softly. Oh, I'm so glad you've come. I hope you won't be dull here. I hope you'll stay. I hope I shall, I hope I shall be able to make you comfortable. She had a gentle, urgent way of speaking that was very winning. I'm sure I shall be very comfortable, I said. But it's I that am to take care of you. Have you been ill long? It's not me that's ill, really, she said. It's him. Now it was Mr. Robert Eldridge who had written to engage me to attend on his wife, who was, he said, slightly deranged. I see, said I. One must never contradict them. It only aggravates the disorder. The reason she was beginning when his foot sounded on the stairs, and she fluttered off to get candles and hot water. He came in and shut the door. A fair, bearded, elderly man, quite ordinary. You'll take care of her, he said. I don't want her to get to talking to people. She fancies things. What form do the illusions take? I asked prosaically. She thinks I'm mad, he said with a short laugh. It's a very usual form, is that all? It's about enough, and she can't hear things that I can hear, and see that I can see, and she can't smell things. By the way, you didn't see or hear anything of a motor as you came up, did you? I came up in a motor, I said shortly. You never sent to meet me, and a lady gave me a lift. 
I was going to explain about my missing the earlier train when I found that he was not listening to me. He was watching the door. When his wife came in with a steaming jug in one hand and a flat candlestick in the other, he went towards her and whispered eagerly. The only words I caught were, she came in a real motor. Apparently, to these simple people, a motor was a great novelty as to me. My telegram, by the way, was delivered the next morning. They were very kind to me. They treated me as an honored guest. When the rain stopped, as it did late the next day, and I was able to go out, I found that Charlestown was a farm, a large farm, but even to my inexperienced eyes, it seemed neglected and unprosperous. There was absolutely nothing for me to do but to follow Mrs. Eldridge, helping her where I could in her household duties, and to sit with her while she sewed in the homely parlor. When I had been at the house a few days, I began to put together the little things that I had noticed singly, and the life, the, and the life at the farm seemed suddenly to come into focus, as strange surroundings do after a while. I found that I had noticed that Mr. and Mrs. Eldridge were very fond of each other, and that it was a fondness, and their way of showing it was a way that told that they had known sorrow and had borne it together that she showed no sign of mental derangement, save in the persistent belief of hers that he was deranged, that the morning found them fairly cheerful, and that after the early dinner they seemed to grow more and more depressed, that after the early cup of tea, that is just as dusk was falling, they always went for a walk together, that they never asked me to join them in this walk, and that it always took the same direction, across the downs toward the sea that they always returned from this walk pale and dejected, and she sometimes cried afterwards alone in their bedroom while he was shut up in the little room they called the office, where he did his accounts and paid his man's wages, where his hunting crops and guns were kept. After supper, which was early, they always made an effort to be cheerful. I knew that this effort was for my sake, and I knew that each of them thought it was good for the other to make it. Just as I had known before, they showed it to me that Charlestown was surrounded by big trees and a great pond beside it, so I knew, and in as an inexplicable a way, that, these, that with these two fear lived. It looked at me out of their eyes, and I knew too that this fear was not her fear. I had not been two days in the place before I found that I was beginning to be fond of them both. They were so kind, so gentle, so ordinary, so homely, the kind of people who ought not to have known the name of fear, the kind of people to whom all honest, simple joys should have come by right, and no sorrows but such as come to us all, the death of old friends and the slow changes of advancing years. They seemed to belong to the land, to the downs and the copses and the old pastures and the lessening cornfields. I found myself wishing that I too belonged to these, and that I had been born a farmer's daughter. All the stresses and struggle of cram and exam, of school and college and hospital, seemed so loud and futile compared to these open secrets of the down life, and I felt this the more, as more and more I felt that I must leave it all, and that there was, honestly, no work for me here, such as, for good or ill, I had been trained to do. "'I ought not to stay,' I said to her one afternoon, as we stood in the open door. It was February now, and the snowdrops were thick in tufts beside the flagged path. "'You are quite well.' "'I am,' she said. "'You are quite well, both of you,' I said. "'I oughtn't to be taking your money and doing nothing for it.' "'You're doing everything,' she said. "'You don't know how much you're doing.' "'We had a daughter of our own once,' she said vaguely, "'and then, after a very long pause, "'she said very quietly and distinctly, "'He has never been the same since.' "'How not the same?' I asked, "'turning my face up in the thin February sunshine.' She tapped her wrinkled, yellow-gray forehead, as country people do. Not right here, she said. How? I asked. Dear Mrs. Elridge, tell me. Perhaps I could help somehow. Her voice was so sane, so sweet. It had come to this with me, that I did not know which of these two was the one who needed my help. He sees things that no one else sees, and hears things no one else hears, and smells things you can't smell if you're standing there beside him. I remembered with a sudden smile his words to me on the morning of my arrival. She can't see or hear or smell. And once more I wondered to which of these two I owed my service. Have you any idea why? I asked. She caught my arm. It was after our Bessie died, she said, the very day she was buried. The motor that killed her, they said it was an accident. It was on the Brighton Road. It was a violet color. They go into mourning for queens with Violet, don't they? She added. And my Bessie, she was a queen, so the motor was Violet. 
that was all right, wasn't it? I told myself now that I had seen the woman was not normal, and I saw why. It was grief that had turned her brain. There must have been some change in my look, though I ought to have known better, for she said suddenly, No, I'll not tell you any more. And then he came out. He never left me alone with her for very long, nor did she ever leave him for very long alone with me. I did not intend to spy upon them, though I am not sure that my position as nurse to one mentally afflicted would not have justified such spying. But I did not spy. It was chance. I had been to the village to get some blue sewing silk for a blouse I was making, and there was a royal sunset which tempted me to prolong my walk. That was how I found myself on the high downs where they sloped to the broken edge of England, the sheer white cliffs against which the English Channel beats forever. The furze was in a flower, and the skylarks were singing, and my thoughts were with my own life, my own hopes and dreams. So I found that I had struck a road, without knowing when I had struck it. I followed it toward the sea, and quite soon it ceased to be a road, and merged in the pathless turf, as a stream sometimes disappears into sand. There was nothing but turf, there was nothing but turf and furze bushes, and the song of the skylarks, and beyond the slope that ended in the cliff's edge, the booming of the sea. I turned back, following the road, which defined itself again a few yards back, and presently sank into a lane, deep-banked and bordered with brown hedge stuff. It was there that I came upon them in the dusk, and I heard their voices before I saw them, and before it was possible for them to see me. It was her voice that I heard first. No, 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 it said. I tell you, yes, it was his voice. There, can't you hear it, that panting sound? Right away, away, it must be at the very edge of the cliff. There's nothing there, dearie, she said. Indeed, there's nothing. You're deaf and blind. Stand back, I tell you, it's close upon us. I came around the corner of the lane then, and as I came, I saw him catch her arm and throw her against the hedge, violently, as though the danger he feared were, indeed, were indeed close upon them. I stopped behind the turn of the hedge and stepped back. They had not seen me. Her eyes were on his face, and they held a world of pity, love, agony. His face was set in a mask of terror, and his eyes moved quickly as though they followed down the lane of the swift passage of something, something that neither she nor I could see. Next moment he was cowering, pressing his body into the hedge, his face hidden in his hands, and his whole body trembling so that I could see it, even from where I was a dozen yards away, through the light screen of the, over through the, light screen of the overgrown hedge. And the smell of it, he said, do you mean to tell me you can't smell it? She had her arms around him. Come home, dearie, she said. Come home. It's all your fancy. Come home with your old wife that loves you. They went home. The next day, I asked her to come to my room and look at the new blue blouse. When I had shown it to her, I told her what I had seen and heard yesterday in the lane. And now I know, I said, which of you it is that wants care. To my amazement, she said very eagerly, which? Why, of course, he, I told her, there was nothing there. She sat down on the chintz-covered armchair by the window and broke into wild weeping. I stood by her and soothed her as well I could. It's a comfort to know, she said at last. I haven't known what to believe. Many a time lately, I've, I've wondered whether, after all, it could be me that was mad, like he said. And there was nothing there. There was always nothing there. And it's on him the judgment, not on me. On him. Well, that's something to be thankful for. So her tears, I told myself, had been more of relief at her own escape. I looked at her with distaste and forgot that I had been fond of her, so that her next words cut me like little knives. It's bad enough for him as it is, but it's nothing to what it would be for him if I was really to go off my head and left him to think he'd brought it on me. You see, now I can look after him the same as I've always done. It's only once in the day it comes over him. He couldn't bear it if it was all the time, like it'll be for me now. It's much better it should be him. I'm better able to bear it than he is. I kissed her then and put my arms around her and said, Tell me what it is that frightens him so. And it's every day, you say? Yes, ever since. I'll tell you. It's a sort of comfort to speak out. It was a violet-colored car that killed our Bessie. You know our girl that I told you about. And it's a violet-colored car that he thinks he sees, every day up there in the lane. And he says he hears it and that he smells the smell of the machinery. The stuff they put in it, you know? Petrol? Yes, and you can see he hears it, and you can see he sees it. It haunts him as if it was a ghost. You see, it was he that picked her up after the violet car went over her. 
It was like that that turned him. I only saw her as he carried her in in his arms, and then he'd covered her face. But he saw her just as they'd left her lying in the dust. You could see the place in the road where it happened for days and days. Didn't they come back? Oh, yes, they came back. But Bessie didn't come back. But there was a judgment on them. The very night of the funeral, that violet car went over the cliff, dashed to pieces every soul in it. That was the man's widow that drove you home the first night. I wonder she uses a car after that, I said. I wanted something commonplace to say. Oh, said Mrs. Eldridge, it's all what you're used to. We don't stop walking because our girl was killed in the road. Motoring comes as natural to them as walking to us. There's my old man calling. Poor old dear. He wants me to go out with him. She went, all in a hurry, and in her hurry slipped on the stairs and twisted her ankle. It all happened in a minute, and it was a bad sprain. When I had bound it up and she was on the sofa, she looked at him, standing as if he were undecided, staring out the window with his cap in his hand, and she looked at me. Mr. Eldridge mustn't miss his walk, she said. You go with him, my dear. A breath of air will do you good. So I went, understanding as well as though he had told me that he did not want me with him, and that he was afraid to go alone, and that yet he had to go. We went up the lane in silence. At that corner, he stopped suddenly, caught my arm, and dragged me back. His eyes followed something I could not see. Then he exhaled and held a breath and said, I thought I heard a motor coming. He had found it hard to control his terror, and I saw beads of sweat on his forehead and temples. Then we went back to the house. The sprain was a bad one. Mrs. Eldridge had to rest, and again the next day it was I who went with him to the corner of the lane. This time he could not, or did not try to, conceal what he felt. There, listen, surely you can hear it. I heard nothing. Stand back, he cried shrilly, suddenly, and we stood back close along the hedge. And again the eyes followed something invisible to me, and again the held breath exhaled. It will kill me one of these days, he said, and I don't know that I care how soon, if it wasn't for her. Tell me, I said, full of that importance, that conscious competence that one feels in the presence of other people's troubles. He looked at me. I will tell you, by God, he said. I couldn't tell her. Young lady, I've gone so far as wishing myself a Roman for the sake of a priest to tell it to. But I can tell you, without losing my soul more than it's already lost. Do you ever hear tell of a violet car that got smashed up? Went over a cliff? Yes, I said. Yes. The man that killed my girl was new to the place, and he hadn't any eyes or ears, or he'd have known me, seeing we'd been face to face at the inquest. And you'd have thought he'd have stayed at home that one day with the blinds drawn down, but not he. He was swirling and swiveling all about the country in that cursed violet car at the very time we were burying her. And that dusk, there was a mist coming up. He comes up behind me in this very lane, and I stood back, and he pulls up, and he calls out with his damned lights full in my face. Can you tell me the way to Hexham, my man, he says. I'd have liked to show him the way to hell, and that was the way for me, not him. I don't know how I came to do it. I didn't mean to do it. I didn't think I was going to, and before I knew anything, I said, straight ahead. I said, keep straight ahead. Then the motor thing panted, chuckled, and he was off. I ran after him to try to stop him, but what's the use of running after these motor devils? And he kept straight on, and every day since then, Every dear day that car comes by, the violet car that nobody can see but me, and it keeps straight on. You ought to go away, I said, speaking as I had been trained to speak. You fancy these things. You probably fancied the whole thing. I don't suppose you ever did tell the violet car to go straight ahead. I expect it was all imagination, and the shock of your poor daughter's death. You ought to go right away. I can't, he said earnestly. If I did, someone else would see the car. You see, somebody has to see it every day as long as I live. If it wasn't me, it would be someone else, and I'm the only person who deserves to see it. I wouldn't like anyone else to see it. It's too horrible. It's much more horrible than you think, he added slowly. I asked him, walking beside him down the quiet lane, what it was so horrible about the violet car. I think I quite expected him to say that it was splashed with his daughter's blood. What he did say was... It's too horrible to tell you. And he shuddered. I was young then, and youth always thinks it can move mountains. I persuaded myself that I could cure him of his delusion by attacking, not the main fort that is always, to begin with, impregnable, but one, so to speak, of the outworks. I set myself to persuade him not to go to that corner in the lane in the hour in the afternoon. But if I don't, someone else will see it. There will be no one else to see it, I said briskly. 
someone will be there. Mark my words, someone will be there and then they'll know. Then I'll be the someone, I said. Come, you stay at home with your wife and I'll go and I'll see. And if I see it, I promise I'll tell you. And if I don't, well, then I'll be able to go away with a clear conscience. A clear conscience, he repeated. I argued with him in every moment when it was possible to catch him alone. I put all my will and all my energy into my persuasions. Suddenly, like a door that you've been trying to open and that has resisted every key to the last one, he gave way. Yes, I should go to the lane, and he would not go. I went. Being, as I said before, a novice in the writing of stories, I perhaps haven't made you understand that it was quite hard for me to go, that I felt myself at once a coward and a heroine. This business of an imaginary motor that only one poor old farmer could see probably probably appears to you quite commonplace and ordinary. It was not so with me. You see, the idea of this thing had dominated my life for weeks and months, had dominated it even before I knew the nature of the domination. It was that this was the fear that I had known to walk with these two people, the fear that had shared their bed and board, that lay down and rose up with them, the old man's fear of this and his fear of his fear, and the old man was terribly convincing. When one talked with him, it was quite difficult to believe that he was mad and that there wasn't and couldn't be a mysteriously horrible motor that was visible only to him and invisible to other people. And when he said that, if he were not on the lane, someone else would see it. It was easy to say nonsense, but to think nonsense was not so easy, and to feel nonsense was quite oddly difficult. I walked up and down the lane in the dusk, wishing not to wonder what might be the hidden horror in the violet car. I would not let blood into my thoughts. I was not going to be fooled by thought transference or any of those transcendental follies. I was not going to be hypnotized into seeing things. I walked up the lane. I had promised him to stand near the corner for five minutes, and I stood there in the deepening dusk, looking up toward the downs and the seas. There were pale stars. Everything was very still. Five minutes is a long time. I held my watch in my hand. Four, four and a quarter, four and a half, five. I turned instantly, and then I saw that he had followed me. He was standing a dozen yards away, and his face was turned from me. It was turned towards a motor that had shot up the lane. It came very swiftly, and before it came to where he was, I knew that it was very horrible. I crushed myself back into the crackling bare hedge, as I should have done to leave room for the passage of a real car, though I knew this one was not real. It looked real, but I knew it was not. As it neared him, he started back, then suddenly he cried out. I heard him. No, no, no more, no more, was what he cried, and with that he flung himself down on the road in front of the car, and its great tires passed over him. Then the car shot past, and I saw what the full horror of it was. There was no blood. That was not the horror. The color of it was, as she had said, violet. I got to him and got his head up. He was dead. I was quite calm and collected now, and felt that to be and felt that to be so was extremely credible to me. I went to the cottage where a laborer was having tea. He got some men and a hurdle. When I told his wife, the first intelligible thing she said was, it's better for him. Whatever he did, he's paid for it now. So it looks as though she had known or guessed more than he thought. I stayed with her till her death. She did not live long. You think perhaps that the old man was knocked down and killed by a real motor, which happened to come that way of all ways at the hour, which happened to come that way of all ways at that hour of all hours, and happened to be of all colors violet. Well, a real motor leaves its mark on you where it kills you, doesn't it? But when I lifted up that old man's head from the road, there was no mark on him, no blood, no broken bones. His hair was not disordered, nor his dress. I tell you, there was not even a speck of mud on him, except where he touched the road in falling. There were no tire marks in the mud. The motor car that killed him and went was like a shadow, and he threw himself down. It, it swerved a little so that both its wheels should go over him. He died, the doctor said, of heart failure. I am the only person to know that he was killed by a violet car, which, having killed him, went noiselessly away toward the sea, and that car was empty. There was no one in it. It was just a violet car that moved along the lane swiftly and silently and was empty. I hope you enjoyed that little story there. We'll be back in a couple of weeks for another podcast episode. In the meantime, be sure to check back, hit that subscribe bell, 
and I'll see you on and I'll see you next Wednesday for another video. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope you have something soft and fluffy to cuddle with. Ciao!